Hey, good morning. It is uh, great to see you. Thank you for taking time to join us wherever you are and whenever you happen to be viewing this. Hey, a couple of things I want to share with you that uh, if you are a part of our local community, you will know that uh, we have done lunch as a huge part of our Sundays for a long time. Last Sunday, we resumed lunch after services. It went great. Uh, we're having it catered by Bodacious Barbecue. So we bring the food. We're having people serve it to you as you go through the line to minimize contact. And so it was a great day. We had a lot of people stay for lunch. It went really well. So we just want to make sure you know uh, we're back up and running with that as well. So you'll know to factor that into your decisions to be here on Sunday. So services at 11, lunch whenever we get done, around 12-ish or so. One thing I also want to share with you, there are some adult ministry activities coming up here shortly. Um, there'll be some more that they'll be announced later, but these are the ones we want to let you know about for right now. On Wednesdays, May the 5th and May the 19th, uh, folks are going to gather in Maxwell Hall starting from about 10 to 12 and play some games, uh, Mexican Train, 42, Domino's Bridge, whatever happens to be there. Um, and then once the games are over, around 12, 1230-ish, um, have lunch together. So uh, just know that those are activities that are going to start really coming up this Wednesday, the May the 5th, and then in a couple weeks later on May the 19th. And then those will continue on the first and the third Wednesdays of the month. So those will be activities rolling around. So if you're in our community locally and want to come and have some fun and some fellowship and just play some games together, uh, keep those on your schedules. If you have questions, uh, feel free to call Dr. Bill Smith. Uh, he's sort of heading those activities up. And so if you have a question about it or what lunch might be or how that's going to work, just touch base with him. So we look forward to seeing you there soon. Today is the day that the Lord has made, regardless of wherever you are and regardless of what day it is. May we all rejoice, be glad in it, and worship together. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. The planets form, and if the stars amaze the worship, so light. I can see your heart in nature. Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so alive Sky, canvas of you. 
same great kid you used to be. But it's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you.
This is Gordon. Prepare to lower the bridge. Tell me your name. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. Bruce? What a, what a great clip. What a, what a great line in that clip. And it's not necessarily who you are deep down on the inside, but it's what you do that defines you. Those are two clips sort of put side by side from a movie entitled Batman Begins. Uh, it's one, obviously one of the superhero uh, that's part of a three-movie trilogy where Christian Bale portrays Batman. You kind of get to see his version of that. And uh, the first clip is from earlier in the movie, and the second one is from almost at the end of the movie. Um, but that, that line was what you do that defines you as the story unfolds becomes a really driving force for Bruce Wayne, who has, as a child has watched his parents be killed um, and has seen his city be corrupt and violent um, and, and evil. And so he believes something can be done. He believes his city can be saved. And so he steps up and does something about what he believes and he thinks and he feels. Now, that dynamic plays out in your lives and in mine as well in a variety of areas. There are things that, that you and I think. There are things that you and I feel, we believe, we wish, want, hope for. But the question is, do we step up and do something that backs up or that validates what we say we think or feel or believe? And it applies to lots of areas in our life. When it comes to relationships, it's that way. When we say there's a relationship that is meaningful or it's important to us, well, do we actually make the time for the person in the relationship? When we say you know, things like our, this is our finances is important, it applies into that. It applies to things we think politically. It applies, of course, to things that we believe in our faith life. The things that we say are important. The things that we say matter. The things that we say are significant. Do our actions, the things that we do, do they back those statements of faith and belief up? Jesus said this pretty much the same way, not exactly the way Batman did. You're sitting there going, man, is Bill trying to compare Batman and Jesus? No, I'm not. Although I will say as an interesting off sort of tangent and thought, if you have been or even if you haven't, I've been a person that's watched superhero movies or read comic books and sort of that whole genre, it is amazing how many of the ideas and storylines and, and some of the principles in the superhero sort of genre of stuff come straight from the principles and thoughts of the Bible and the stories of the Bible themselves. It's amazing. It's almost as if they read the Bible itself and they're like, well, let that influence. And so it's amazing how much the scriptures, how much the stories of the Bible and the stories of faith have had a difference and made an impact on the culture around us, even when it comes to movies that are made and the themes that get portrayed out through the superhero genre. So off, off of that little tangent, back to this. So Jesus has some words to say that follow in the line of, of what we just heard about. It's what we do that defines us. And so for that, we're going to go to the Gospel of John in chapter 15. We've been tracking in John for a while, and, and leading up to this, this is the night that Jesus is with the disciples for his last time before the crucifixion. Um, he has done through the communion thing, this is my body, this is my blood. He's washed their feet. Thomas has left to go do the things that he's going to do and betray Jesus. Jesus has told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and my Father's house has many rooms. He's told them about the Holy Spirit that is to come, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few weeks. Um, but Jesus said, I'm going to leave, and when I leave, the Holy Spirit comes to lead and guide and, and equip you. And then he gets to the part we're going to talk about this morning where he gives them a picture for them to understand the relationship that they as his disciples and that you and I as his followers have with him. And so here we go. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So abide in me and I in you. For as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in them, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If everyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and they're burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified. So what did Jesus about to say? Hey, so, hey, so here's what you'll know how you glorify the Father. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. There you go. But very similar, nonetheless. Jesus, Jesus is offering to his disciples a picture of, of an image for them to understand the nature of their relationship with him and the nature of our relationship with him as well. As he sort of paints this picture, says, hey, you know, there's the vine, there's some branches, there's a vine dresser, kind of a gardener. He makes sure to know everybody knows their parts. You know, I'm the vine. You guys are all the branches as my followers. God the Father is the vine dresser, the gardener who tends to all of the branches and all of the vines. And, and, and so Jesus, as he shares this, there are some things that are stated that, that, that you and I can learn from and apply to our life as well. And the first one I want to talk about, it should be a relief. It should come as a relief to us. Once I tell you what, it, we, we should be able to just go, oh, and exhale and go, man, that helps so much. And here it is, that Jesus is making sure that we understand that he is the vine and we are the branches. So have you ever gotten to a place in life? Let me ask you this. Have you ever gotten to a place in life where you saw things that were coming ahead for you and you looked at it and you go, man, I'm, just, I'm not sure how I'm going to survive this. I'm not sure how I'm going to get through this. I, I just don't think I can do it. And, and if you've watched other people and their life experiences sort of inserted yourself and go, man, I, I don't know how they're getting through that. I don't know how I would deal with that if that were me. I don't know how I would be able to function if I were in their shoes and living their circumstances. Have you ever heard a message from a preacher like me, someone, a pastor who's delivered a message or maybe read in the scriptures some of the expectations of being a Jesus follower and you just heard them and you're like, man, I don't, I don't you know, hey, that whole, that, that whole, like, you know, forgiving people, man, I'm just, I'm not sure I can do that. I've been wrong too many times. I just don't think I can actually forgive people. And that, and that whole love of my neighbor thing, I'm like, you don't even know my neighbors. I, I, that just, I'm not so sure I'm up on board with that thing. And being generous and helping other people in their times of need, you're, you just all the things that you hear, you just go, man, I just, I, I can't do that. That's beyond my ability. That's, that's just too far down the road for me to ever get there. That's just out of my reach. I just can't quite reach out far enough. If you've ever had those thoughts or ever had those experiences where we just felt like, I just can't do this, Jesus would look at us and say, you weren't supposed to by yourself. That's the whole point. I am the vine. You are the branches. You are too. And he uses the word abide in me, which is like stay close, stay connected. You weren't supposed to do all that by yourself. When you find circumstances that you feel like, I just can't do it by myself. I can't handle this much stress. I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to ever be what I'm supposed to be. Jesus would say, you're not supposed to do it by yourself. That's what I am for. That's why you are the branches. I am the vine. You stay connected to me, and you draw your strength from me. You draw your energy from me, and you draw your very life from me. And in me, you can do all kinds of things that by yourself you cannot do because you weren't meant to do them. Man, we should hear that and go, oh, 
well, God, man, because I was starting to feel like a failure. I was starting to feel like I wasn't reading the Bible enough or I didn't, I didn't pray enough. I was starting to feel like maybe I didn't believe enough because I just couldn't do some of the things I felt like I was being called to do. And Jesus would say, that's what I'm here for. You weren't meant to do that by yourself. That's part of being attached to the vine is that the branches draw their strength and their life and their energy from the vine itself. And then Jesus also says something else that hopefully should help us not panic, not sort of freak out when these things occur. And, and the thing that he says is this. He says, hey, look, even the most fruit-bearing branches that there are, even the most plentiful branches that have all the fruits on them, they too get pruned. Even the most faithful Jesus follower is going to experience trials and tragedies and suffer and loss and death and pain and despair and depression and fear and on and on and on. Being a faithful Jesus follower does not exclude us from experiencing those things that cause pain in our lives. And Jesus says, hey, look, even the most fruit-bearing branch that there is gets pruned. It gets cut back. So that as my followers, you need to understand that in your life, when those things happen to you, don't panic don't begin to question. Don't begin to look around and go, well, man, maybe my faith isn't strong enough. And don't look around and go, well, maybe there's something wrong with Jesus because Jesus isn't, I, I'm not protected from all this stuff. And then maybe there's something wrong with God and the Bible really isn't true. And then we just walk out our faith. Jesus is like, hey, take a deep breath. When those times of life come your way and when you're in that period of being pruned, there isn't necessarily anything wrong with you. And there's certainly not anything wrong with Jesus or the Holy Spirit or the Father. It is part of the natural process of being a branch. To grow fruit, produce fruit, be lush, full of life, and at times be cut back and be pruned. Many of you probably know what that looks like in your own yards in a variety of ways because you, you've seen how this looks in your yard. I got a couple of pictures. I'll show you what it looks like at my house. The first picture I want to show you uh, is a picture of a, a healthy sago palm, um, one of many that we have in our house. You'll, house. you'll see big, green, lush, full. That one stands about five and a half to six feet tall all the way up to the top of the green fronds there. Um, the, the trunk itself stands about three feet-ish tall. I mean, beautiful, beautiful plant. But you know what happened here in East Texas that you all will remember that we all lived through? Then came Snowmageddon or the snowpocalypse of 2021, whichever way you refer to it. And so that green, lush, full of life plant changed to this picture. <laughs> now, the golden arches of McDonald's has been an endearing symbol for people for decades and decades. They have served billions of people. I myself love a great Big Mac and some French fries from McDonald's. It's a wonderful place to go. But let me tell you something. On a sago palm, golden branches are not really a good sign. What that is a sign of is that the branches themselves are dead, it's amazing because that palm looked that green the day before the snowstorm hit. And after the snowstorm hit, that's what it looked like because all of the branches were dead. You know what it looks like now? Here's a picture of what it looks like now. Yep. Yep. Just a stub standing up out of the yard. My yard's full of those things. My yard looks really different with all those 30-something segos that were lush and green, and they're all just little stubby things sticking up out of the ground. That is what it looks like to be pruned. That's what it feels like at times to be pruned as well, doesn't it? I mean, we all go through life experiences and circumstances where we feel exactly like that last picture. No life, no energy, a little bit pained, 
We feel isolated. We feel cut off because we have been pruned. One of the things Jesus also says that should be an encouragement to all of us is that it is seasonal. There are seasons to everything that we see around us. We, you know, this time of the spring is spring, and then comes summer, then fall, then winter, then spring, summer, fall, winter. You, you see some of those changes take place, right? You see things come out from being dormant, and now they're green and lush again, and flowers are blooming, all that kind of stuff. It's seasonal. And for you and I as people of faith, as Jesus followers, the seasons apply to us as well. Jesus said, there will be seasons of your life where you are producing fruit and it's life and it's vibrant and it's healthy. And I mean, you're doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, you're praying for other people and you're being generous and making a difference in people's lives. You're being gracious and merciful. You're forgiving people. You're reconciling relationships. I mean, it's just a powerful thing to behold the fruit that your life is bearing as you glorify the Father in heaven and demonstrate your faithfulness in following Jesus. But then there are seasons of life where we're pruned and we're cut back. And all of a sudden we experience pain and loss and fear and we're uncertain and we're a bit afraid. It is a season. And the encouraging part for all of us is that it is temporary. It won't last while it feels like it, we feel like there's just despair. We're not sure how, you know, got to get up one more day and put our feet in front of the other one. And we don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And what light we do see, we're pretty sure is a train coming right at us. It doesn't have to last that long. It is just but a season. Because Jesus, remember he says, the, even the branches that bear all the fruit, they are pruned. They are cut back so that they will bear fruit again. That's the point of the pruning. It is a part of the process and the nature of keeping things healthy. There is a growth and there is a production period and then there's a pruning period so that growth and production takes place again. And so if you find yourself in a season where you've been pruned and you're looking like that plant all by yourself and like really sort of scared and not having lots of life, it's only temporary. And the season of life and fruit and production is just ahead. Now, sometimes we find ourselves in this pruning process where we've been separated from the vine and we've been cut away and thrown off into the pile because of our own choices, our own decision to walk away from. We just get to a place and we're like, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm done with the whole Bible thing. I'm done with the whole church thing. I'm done with the whole Jesus, Holy Spirit, God thing. I'm just out. And we remove ourselves from the vine. If that's where you find yourself, please be encouraged and know that it too can only be temporary. It doesn't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to be that way forever. And all we have to do when we're in that period when we've walked away is just turn back to the vine and Jesus is there with open arms to say, come back near to me and draw your strength and your energy, and your life from me. Because part of what is going on, part of what is at stake, is God's life being transplanted into each of us. This whole connection thing with the branches and the vine and the Holy Spirit and God, it's, it's the way that God transplants himself into each of us. That's what's at stake when we remove ourselves from the vine and we cut ourselves off is that we lose that connection with God himself as he is infusing us with the life that comes from him. Now, Jesus also says one more thing that's important for us to take note of. And that is, it is totally fine to think things and believe things and feel things and want, wish, and hope for things. But Jesus makes it very clear there is also an action component to this whole dynamic. That at times, beyond what we say and think and feel and believe, we need to step up and then do something about it. Because it is what we do that defines 
who we are as Jesus' followers and whose we are as we bring glory to the Father himself. Words and thoughts and feelings and beliefs need to then become actions as we bear the fruit on the branches. And you see it in lots of different places in life. I get asked frequently about what I believe or think about certain people or things uh, that are going on in the world. And, 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 I, and I just respond with the same thing. It's like, look, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me. You can tell me whatever you think. You can tell me whatever matters, whatever is important, whatever is significant. I'm going to watch what you do, however. Because if you do things that back up what you say matters or important, then I'm inclined to listen to you. But if you give me a whole list of things that matters, that's important, that's significant, and then you don't do anything to back that up, then I'm inclined to not pay as much attention to you anymore. And it happens this way in tons of places of life. I mean, just, just to use, just to use a, a, an example that we will all follow, people to ask me what I always think. You know, hey, Pastor, Bill, what do you think about the global warming and, and climate change and all that kind of stuff? And, and, and my response is pretty simple. It's like, look, I, there's certainly science there to, to follow and suggest and understand how the whole thing works if we, if we can understand how the whole planet works in and of itself. I said, but, but here's what I do. Beyond whether it is or isn't the case, Folks that are telling me I need to make all the changes in my life and do all the things differently in my life, but aren't doing them themselves, I tend to not pay as much attention to. And you're going, wow, that's a political. Hey, like, not, we'll back off of that. We'll go in a different direction. And, and in case that you feel like I picked on one political side of the spectrum than the other, hey, both sides of the political spectrum are as guilty of this. They, they all at times do this. So I'm not picking on one side or the other. In fact, I'll let me jump into my own profession field for a minute because it that, that applies here. People say, well, Pastor Bill, what do you think about so-and-so who does all these healing ministries and on TV and, 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 and touching people and being filled with the Spirit and they get up and they walk? What do you think of all that stuff? And I say, well, here's the thing. I would never discount the fact that through God's power, people can be healed. I absolutely would believe that. I said, but here's where I, 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 take, I, I sort of take a second look at it. That I get you up there and you're doing all that thing and you're healing some people and you're doing it on stage for money. Then where are the opportunities where, because I feel like if you're a person of God and you're wanting to heal people and serve people and, and be passionate to people, then you'd also go into a hospital floor and just heal everybody for free. I get the earning the money part to make a living, but then there would also be the other part as well. And I don't see that one very often. So if you feel like I picked on your political spectrum part of the I'm going to pick on my own profession a little bit as well. Let, let, me, let me make it a little more personal. Let me just sort of get into our own personal lives because it, it applies that way all the time. You know, our family lives, mine lives in Georgia, and my wife, Laurelise, lives in North Carolina. And so about 23 years ago, we moved first to Shreveport, uh, Louisiana, and then, of course, into Texas. And we've been out here ever since. And so over the course of all those years, we have made over a hundred trips uh, back east to go visit family and people have commented about man why do you you make so many trips and even our kids are like man y'all are like we're in the car all the time making all these trips and Arlene and I made it really simple we said well it's important to us that to the best of our ability our kids knew their grandparents and great-grandparents and their cousins and uncles as best that they could it wasn't perfect but we felt like it was important enough that we made all the effort we could possibly make because it mattered. Just even a few years ago, my grandmother turned 90 years old, and they were having a kind of a surprise party for her. Um, sort of knew some people were coming, but not everybody else that she knew, and, and, and you only turn 90 once. And, and so Jordan, my daughter and I, we got in the car, because we were the only two that were able to go from to here. But we got in the car literally on Thursday, made the 12-hour drive all the way over to just east of Atlanta, Stayed Friday, did the party on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon at lunch, got in the car and drove back to be home, which is a ton amount of driving. But here's why we did it. And when we got there, of course, Jordan, I made the 12-hour drive. We get to my mom's house. We're going to go knock on the door and have my grandmother come and answer the door and see us, not knowing that we're coming. And so we get there and, of course, making a 12-hour drive is a long drive. You're kind of tired. And I looked at Jordan and I said, look, some point in this time of the trip, you're going to be really tired. 
And I said, and at some point of this trip, you're going to go, why in the world did we spend 24 hours in the car driving to stay somewhere barely 36 hours? I said, this moment right here is exactly why. This is why. When we ring that doorbell and your great-grandmother comes to the door and sees us, remember the look on her face because that is why we've done this. To be as a part of our family as much as we could has been so important in our life, which is why we get in the car and make those kinds of trips. It's putting into action what you say you actually believe. Many of us as parents probably all taught our kids bunches of the same things. And I would imagine most all of us as parents made sure to tell our kids being honest is the most important, that honesty is the best policy. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you know, because nothing is more important than being a person of integrity and your, and your honor and your word. And it's the one thing that people can't take from you. It's one of the few things that folks cannot take away from you is your truthfulness. Always tell the truth, always be honest. And then as parents, we'd say things like, hey, you need to do what I say, but not what I do. <laughs> well, it's not long before kids figure out that if mom and dad aren't doing what they say is important, then maybe what they say is important isn't as important as they say. Because if they're not doing it themselves. See, there's how that whole being truthful thing would play out at times. And we always think about, well, if you're out and doing something or something going on, make sure you tell the truth. But it's much more simple than that, which is where kids pick up on it much more easily. Sitting around the dinner table phone ring. Now, granted, you probably have to be my age or older to have experienced this because when the phone rang, you went over and actually picked it up because it was ringing and not not your cell phone. That's a different dynamic. You'd go pick up the phone and on the other end of the phone, they go, yes, um, is is, uh, William Blanks there? And your response might be, uh, no, he's not here right now. Can I take a message? Because you knew if somebody was using your formal name, they didn't know you, first of all, and were probably trying to call and sell you something that you didn't want or need either one. And so your immediate response is, no, he's not here. The problem is that it's you saying that. And your kids are sitting at the table watching dad lie to the person on the phone. Now, I'm not suggesting buy all the garbage they're trying to sell you, but here would be the truthful response. Thank you for your time. I'm not interested in what you're selling. Have a good evening. Click. Truthful. Honest. Not, he's not here. See, do the things that we do back up the things that we say are important or that matter to us? One more, and we'll wrap up. This past weekend, Laurie and I had the opportunity to attend a fundraising event for one of our partnered ministries um, that our church here is partnered with. Uh, it's called Hannah House. Um, Hannah House operates out of Gilmer, just a little bit north of Longview. Uh, they are a tremendous ministry that come alongside women who find themselves being pregnant who are in some unbelievably complicated, unbelievably dangerous life circumstances. Some of the women literally come to them off of the street being homeless. Some of the women come to them even having been uh, released from jail uh, and being pregnant. I mean, as they went in, they're pregnant, and they're coming out. I mean, they they come to this place in just some unbelievably challenging circumstances. And then to add being pregnant on top of that makes their circumstances unmanageable by themselves. And so the Hannah House comes alongside these women, brings them on the the site of their facility, and, and, and their whole goal, their purpose, their their driving force is to help the women choose life. Now, they may not actually keep the child itself once it's born. Likely, they don't. But helping their women realize that there are other choices besides just ending the pregnancy and to choose life. And while we were there, we saw some of the video testimonies of some of the women that have participated in the ministry who came to Hannah House having some just crazy stories. And they talked about how filled with despair their life was and how their life seemed just totally unmanageable. And through the the people at the Hannah House and and Melanie, who directs the place there, uh, through the work that they do, felt encouraged and felt loved for the first time in a long time and saw that there were options that may not necessarily involve them keeping their child, but that there were others who would love to have that child. We saw the testimonies of couples who had tried for years to have children themselves and just just couldn't. 
and yet partnered with Hannah House, got to meet the birth moms. And so in watching these testimonies kind of be put together, you actually saw that through the work of what Hannah House has been doing, they literally have saved lives of children in addition to making a tremendous difference in the lives of the pregnant moms, as well as make a difference in the lives of couples trying to expand their families and the people that they care for. You see, everybody, starting at the very top, all the volunteers, everybody that participates in the ministry of the Hannah House, believes in the sanctity of life believes that we are all created uniquely and wonderfully made in the image of God and that every life has value and every life has meaning regardless of the circumstances under which that life began. And beyond just thinking it and feeling it and believing it, they have done something about it. And when you see what goes on there, you see what bearing fruit looks like. You see, beyond who we are on the inside, and that matters, don't, don't misunderstand the bill, Bill's trying to say it doesn't matter who we are on the inside, it absolutely does. But beyond who we are on the inside, it's what we do that defines you and I as Jesus followers and defines us as glorifying, honoring God himself. You see, it's fine to think and believe and feel and wish and want and hope. But at some point, there has to be action. And Jesus calls that action bearing fruit. And he says to his disciples, and he says to you and I, by this, the Father is glorified. That in your faithfully following in Jesus' footsteps and putting into action what you believe, that you bear fruit for others to see and experience themselves, and therefore you are glorifying the Father. So, fellow branches, are you ready to bear some fruit? Amen. Like you've never been before The life you knew In a thousand pieces on the floor And words fall short in times like these When this world drives you to your knees You think you're never gonna get back To the you they used to be Tell your heart to beat again Close your eyes and breathe it in Let the shadows fall away Step into the light of grace Yesterday is a closing door You don't live there anymore Say goodbye to where you've been And tell your heart to beat again Just let that word wash over you It's alright now Love's healing hands have pulled you through So get back up, take step one Leave the darkness, feel the sun Cause your story's far from over And your journey's just begun Tell your heart to be Close your eyes and breathe it in Let the shadows fall away Step into the light of grace Yesterday's a closing door You don't live there anymore Say goodbye to where you've been And tell your heart to be Every heartbreak and every 
picture that reminds you Who has carried you this far Cause love sees further Than you ever could In this moment heaven's working Everything for your good Tell your heart to beat again Close your eyes and breathe it in Let the shadows fall away Step into the light of grace Yesterdays are closing doors Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this for the remembrance of me. Take these gifts, O Lord, and sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. And now as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Will you join me in our unison prayer? Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and the mind, minds and the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure love Just the sum of every high and every low Remind me once again just who I am Because I need to know You'll have every victory